Hi, everybody. I'm Adriana Hopkins with ABC7 News, coming to you from Prince George's County for PGC MLS this week. And there is so much happening this week, from cooking to opera to keeping your kids engaged in STEM. Shirley Chisholm was the first Black woman elected to the U.S. Congress and the first to campaign for the presidency. She coined the empowering phrase of, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Join PGC MLS for a film discussion of 72 unbought and unbossed in celebration of Women's History Month on Monday at 7 p.m. What's on the menu? This week, PGC MLS is hosting a pair of culinary events for all of you foodies out there. Also happening on Monday at 7 p.m., culinary historian Michael W. Twitty talks about his new cookbook, Rice, a Savior of the South Cookbook. Learn about the importance of rice in American Southern cuisine. And then on Tuesday at 7 p.m., learn about the history of black female chefs and cookbook authors and watch a cooking demo of one of the Queen of Creole's most famous dishes, breakfast shrimp and baked cheese grits. In this week's career chat, learn about becoming an opera singer on Wednesday at 3 p.m. Learn the ropes from Barrington Lee, bass baritone, who in the 2018-19 season debuted as Judd Fry in Oklahoma at the Denver Center for the Performing Arts. Grab a marker and paper and draw along with Mark Parisi, who writes and illustrates the Marty Pants series, along with the award-winning syndicated cartoon, Off the Mark, this Friday at 3 p.m. Learn how Mark got his start and hear some fun facts about Marty Pants. The library has partnered with the fantastic team at Future Makers to provide families in Prince George's County with free at-home STEM projects that can be picked up from local libraries via curbside service. Customers can pick up this month's kit, Wigglebots, at your local library branch while supplies last. And then Friday at noon, build your bot along with us at the STEM at Home virtual event. Visit pgcmls.info slash STEM dash two dash go for more information. Thanks for watching PGC MLS this week. There's always so much more happening and you can find out about everything that's happening at your local library at pgcmls.info. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Prince George's County Memorial Library System in Maryland. My name is Nicholas Brown, and I'm the COO for Communication and Outreach at the Library. On behalf of everyone at the Library and also our partner, the Prince George's County Human Relations Commission, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to be part of our community here. Uh, on the interwebs. Uh, we are so, 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 so thrilled to welcome an amazing writer, speaker, and James Beard Award winner tonight, Michael W. Twitty, to our author series. As a culinary historian, Michael brilliantly captures the way that food, and in particular American Southern cuisine, serves as a guide through Black and American history. His book, The Cooking Gene, was recognized as the 2018 James Beard Foundation Book of the Year. He also runs a world-renowned Afro-culinaria blog, and his work follows several major themes, including antebellum Chef and Kosher Soul. Antebellum Chef uh, honors the culinary history and provides for the food future with what Michael calls, quote, culinary justice, end quote. Kosher Soul is the brand that deals with what Michael has termed identity cooking, which explores how we construct complex identities and then express them through how we eat. Michael's new book, Rice, which is the focus of tonight's event, is part of the Savor the South cookbook series, and it explores one of the staple foods that is among the most welcomed on Southern tables and throughout cultures around the world. The book features 51 recipes of Creole, Acadian, soul food, low country, and Gulf Coast origins. Exploring Rice's culinary history and African diasporic identity, Twitty shows how to make Southern classics as well as international dishes. Everything from Savannah rice waffles to Ghanaian crab stew. As Twitty uh, gratefully sums up, quote, Rice connects me to every other person, Southern and global, who is nourished by Rice's traditions and customs, end quote. Michael will be in conversation with our wonderful colleague, Raisha Sims, who is a librarian on our selection team, which means that she's involved in making sure our collection includes the books and materials that you all would like to see. Raisha was also one of the masterminds behind our awesome local author programming last year and is a leader on staff who is helping the library evolve so that we can better support each other in, as Prince Georgians in the years to come. Be sure to borrow Michael's books from the library or your local library, and you can also purchase a copy of Rice and his other book, our books from our partner, Loyalty Bookstores. And we give our special thanks to Peter and the team at UNC Press for helping make tonight's event possible. Uh, before I depart, I'm going to leave you with the words of Dr. Henry Lewis Gates Jr., who said this of Michael's work. 
quote, slavery made the world of our ancestors incredibly remote to us. Thankfully, the work of Michael W. Twitty helps restore our awareness of their struggles and successes bite by bite, giving us a true taste of the past. We hope you enjoy the program and invite you to uh, take the opportunity to reflect on the amazing history and cultural, um, cultural knowledge that Mr. Twitty is going to impart with us all tonight. Thanks so much and enjoy. Hello, hello. Hello, Sister Sims, how are you? I'm wonderful, how are you doing? I'm all right, I'm still here, you still here, we good. Yeah, you know, it's another day, another day. So I thank you, Nick, for that amazing um, introduction. A lot of people, um, he said that you're a cultural, um, a culinary historian. A lot of people may not be familiar with your work. Like he said, you had the cooking gene and also the new book, Rice. Um, could you tell us a little bit about like what a um, culinary historian does and a little bit about your work? Sure. Um, I did. I actually started doing culinary history and living history very early. Um, I remember I was at um, His Lordship's Kindness, actually in Prince George's County, one of my earliest gigs. And um, the director at the time actually got me on my way with the Maryland Humanities Council. Um, they recognized, they did a whole thing about food and they were calling for people who could speak about culinary history. And I went across the entire state of Maryland, Western to Eastern shore, uh, talking about um, the history, the culinary history, the food history um, of African, Afro-Marylanders who were enslaved. Um, that's a part of our story and our history in Maryland that often gets obscured. And so that's how I got my start. And I, you know, I'm a living history interpreter, not a reenactor. That's very important to mention. Um, reenactors and interpreters are not, or do some similar work, but not in the same category. So that's important to mention as well. I mean, reenactors are the people who typically do, if I had to do a rough sketch, um, Raisha, it would be like, Reenactors are more oriented towards um, reenacting war and battle events. Okay. They do. Um, there's a tendency to be a bit more conservative, um, and very male oriented. And um, whereas interpreters are doing more museum work, uh, much more moderate, progressive, much more into showing the, the lives of civilians, domestic people. I mean, that doesn't always work that way, um, but that's pretty much the difference. I don't want anybody to think I'm reenacting slavery, so mm -mm, we, ain't doing no, we ain't doing no Ben Carson moves here. Um, but the other part of it is that um, doing culinary history means you're studying the past, the way people cooked, and that's very important. Not just the food, but the way people related to food and what the, the role that food played in people's lives. Mm. So that's and that's one thing I really enjoyed when I was reading rice and also the cooking gene was that you sort of you rice was kind of used as a vehicle sort of mm -hmm. moving throughout the introduction and stuff. And you kind of told the story, the origin of rice, how rice came to the States. And um, that's one of the more interesting things about the book is that you had so much knowledge about just exa exactly how um, one small aspect of culture of food, which is a huge, you know, most people don't even think about food as, you know, um, a part of it, but it's a huge, huge culture of Black culture, of Southern culture, of American culture. And I think Rice is such an important book for people that, to for anyone to read that's interested in how um, food has such an impact on the things that we do and the things, how, you know, mm -hmm. we come together with family and things like that. And so it was really interesting to see um, just the, the history and the story of such a small item of Rice but it has such a huge impact on the things, you know, that we still do today. Every, you know, that's the thing though. I remember, I remember when I first started blogging, you know, I think people take a lot of things for granted. Um, I think when you do food as recipes and techniques and ingredients, people understand it because they think of just food as being this practical thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, let Whole Foods come out with a new collard green recipe and see how fast people act up. That's what true. I'm, see, wait, wait, wait a minute. I got a better example for you. When they try to do that, like macaroni and cheese thing on, like the the chew or the something or the taste, the bomb, whatever it was, and, yes. and we flipped out. Yes, it's because you know when I, when I like I said when I first started doing this, I remember I got this weird note 
from somebody who I bet was like all into their health or whatnot. But they were like, they were like, food is fuel, nothing more. And I was like, that absolutely isn't true because if I give you chocolate covered ants, and that's not your thing, and not just personal, but that you have a, you might have a cultural taboo against it. You might have a religious taboo against it. You might have a, just an aversion to eating insects. Yeah. Then, then no, food is not fuel. Food is your story. Food is your is your fingerprint. Food is your your footsteps through history. Yeah. I mean, most of my most migrations before um, we had actual wars were based on people's hunger. They wanted to eat. They wanted food. And so it's so critical to like remind people that that everybody's history around the planet is driven by their daily need to eat. That's so true. Um, so in the cooking gene and also um, rice, it's kind of like a, a part memoir, kind of part food odyssey, where you kind of took a journey to discover um, your roots and uh, things like that. I really enjoyed how um, you said in 2011, you kind of became aware of your own amnesia and apathy mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. towards your own culture and your own food. Um, so you kind of took a journey so um, to kind of reconnect to what it was that you had lost or that sort of thing. Can you speak a little bit about that, about that mm-hmm. journey? Because I know a lot of, when I went to do my um, ancestry in 2016, you know, I just submitted my DNA, but I feel like you took an entire journey, you know, you retraced your steps and it was so interesting to read. And so I kind of want to just know a little bit more about oh, that. Oh, sure. Well, I think one of the major things is that one thing I've been saying recently in all of my talks, I'm just going to say it in this one, is that I think one of the reasons why we are so passionate and so deep about our culture, the representations of our culture, the symbolism, and also uh, the texts that people offer of -hmm. different types. The reason why we get flip, we flip out over certain things we don't, we know they ain't right. Or maybe it's just that they're right for some of us, but for others of us, is because we have to go through trauma to get to the tasty stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, we, there's there's not I'm you know, and I I know that the young the youngest generation of us has little patience with some of these stories. I mean, the the fact of the matter is, you got you got to say the word enslavement mm-hmm. or slavery or slave trade. You cannot get rid of the quilt to get to the kente cloth. Can't go to the hard stuff. They're, they're both part of who we are. Mm-hmm. And that's just what it means to be an African in diaspora. Okay. So, so for me, it's like, you know, you spend all this time so-called learning history. Both of us know that we get black history month, white history year. And so you don't really, so the, the context, I mean, no one teaches you, for example, that the debt that America had to France for helping in the American revolution was paid by enslaved grown tobacco from Maryland and Virginia. Or that when the tobacco wore out the land, that the, that that the freedom of your the Europeans would have starved. This is not a hyperbole. It's not a made up fact. The Europeans would have starved if folks in this area and beyond weren't growing the wheat that got exported to Europe during their revolutions. Mm-hmm. Or the fact that the Haitian Revolution was the was the impetus for Napoleon selling the Louisiana Territory. Or the fact the Haitian Revolution started a whole new wave of repression of Black culture and Black religion and Black music in America. And yet, the pushback on that is another part of how the way I talk, I say how, you know, sometimes our greatest form of capital is how we survived our oppression and marginalization. So to be able to have your own sense of memory, I mean, it, it, you, you can't have two sense of memory and be an efficient propaganda machine. Mm-hmm. So you, you spend all this time unlearning the, the the stuff and learning the learning the basic facts. You know, it, it's like how like my sister had it, had it folks in Texas be like, let's let's, let's separate. I said the reason why you separated in the first place was because of slavery. Mm-hmm. You'd be like, oh, the Texans want their freedom. No, the Mexicans gave them all the freedom in the world, but they said you can't have no more slavery. Texans were like, nope. <laughs> so I'm going to defend the Alamo. And they don't teach, right? You never learn that in school, right? It's right. Like, they taught you this version that was yeah. about, you selective know, selective history. Yeah, selective history based on 
based on, you know, whatever testosterone Sam Houston and the like were dealing with. And for me, it was like, no, I want to, what does it really mean to center our ancestors? And one of the things I'm really proud about the cooking gene and with rice and some elements, because it's a different book, um, is the fact that, you know, when I reread it, I was like, okay, did I really live up to my goals here? Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I did was I said, oh, wow. I talked about the people sleeping on the corn shuck mattress. And I talked about the kitchen from their perspective. And I was like, I was like, at some point I realized that maybe just maybe, because an author is never happy with their books. I hope you know that. Oh yeah. Never, never, that. right? Because you work with mm-hmm. books. They're never happy. But 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 the one part I was happy with was ab- above all the mistakes and all the I wish I would have was that part where I, in going back and retrieving memory, which is Sankofa, right? Mm-hmm. You have to retrieve your past to go forward into the future. You have to, right. you have to understand, appreciate, and, and um, break it all down. Yeah, so you have to know where you're going. You know where you're going. The other part was like, I was, I was seeing the, I had, after all these years, I had gotten to the point where I was seeing the world through their lens. And was there, and therefore able to do something that I think very few authors do, which is give enslaved people back their humanity, and credit for and credit for their ownership, and um, um, their agency in their own lives, as opposed yeah. to this narrative, which is you know you know the narrative. Yeah. But um, but the bottom line for me was reclaiming that memory. It was so important because I wanted people to do to do the same in their own families. Yeah. Yeah, to have a sense of pride in the in the things that have um, occurred in their lives and our and you know to be proud of our ancestors who have made something from nothing, you know, right. um, who have come such a long way for us to even be here. So, um, mm-hmm. one thing I really enjoyed was that the centering of African and African American cooking um, in these books and just what it means to have dinner and to have you know that sense of family um, with your people, you know, around and how much food means um, in our culture. And you said a little bit before about um, receiving some kind of pushback while you were doing rice. And tell me a little bit about like some of the pushback in the mail that you received. Well, it's even even up to today. I mean, I just put a, put a, um, a uh, article out with the BBC that kind of helps push the book a little bit, but tells the story. Yeah. And I'm getting all these articles about, wait a minute, hold up, hold up. Well, Jefferson planted rice, okay, yeah. Okay. 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 Yes. There, there. Then that part. Some of that is true. He actually smuggled rice out of the Po River Valley region in Italy. Arborio rice. You know, the rice that's used to make risotto. Okay. And um, he was trying to make it into some kind of like cash crop for temperate parts of North America. Of course, the terroir, the the earth, the climate, all of that matters. Especially when you talk about Italy, it's like a it's like the microclimate country. Like every little spot. If you've watched the Stanley Tucci, you've seen that. But I've actually been to Italy, and it's gorgeous. But it, it, it's traveling from Milan to Venezia into Firenze, from Tuscany to Rome is not this. It's like it's like totally different countries. Okay. So, um, but that was, but you know, the whole idea was, well, I'm not about these Africans, but I'm just like, okay, you're you're missing the point. Um, another person was like, well, Native Americans, and I'm just like rice, and I'm just like. Wild rice isn't the same plant. They're eaten in similar ways, but it's not the same plant. And even when they were eaten, um, Sister Sims, they didn't. I mean, for example, in the in the Great Lakes region, native people um, harvested the rice from the wild, and it was a wild rice is a, is a is a aquatic grass. It's not this. It's wild. It's not the same as Ariza species, which are the rice species that we know from the the um, Eastern Hemisphere, and there's one that's African in origin, explicitly. There's actually several, but there's oh, there's one that's a major crop. And then there's a rice sativa, which is the rice most people eat in the world, was Asian rice. And even those Asian rice species have, have been in Africa for so long that some of them have been diversified by human um, agency and have become their own thing. But I guess the point in both these narratives was, I mean, one person, that was the, guy, the other guy was trying to break it down and be like, oh, you know, well, we already had it here and y'all didn't really do nothing. And I'm like, and I got, I got kind of, I got upset because by that time I received like six or eight or nine 
little hay males. And th- these, those were the nice ones. <laughs> I mean, uh, those ones without expletives. Those were like wow. the sco- scholarly, snooty kind of thing. Oh, but so not really that scholarly because if you don't know that wild rice and domesticated rice are two separate things completely, then you, okay. you embarrass yourself. Yeah, right? you're speaking right. to the scholar. <laughs> Right, you're speaking to me, and I and I, and I, and I don't even claim to be like the, the, the but I know that much. I'm the um, okay. and I guess what I'm really getting at is that in all in every single case of all these emails and the ones I've done, ones I've received before about particularly the subject, the decentering of black women, specifically African women, mm. African American women. Is really it's it's really at the heart of a lot of the controversy. Um, even some of the scholars of early African American history have tried to like go on a deep dive. And I'm I'm not gonna say one of them is one of them is British and 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 okay, quite quite um, arrogant, but has you know tried to um, dismiss the work of Judith Carney white American woman who lived in Africa, who did a lot of this research herself, and Etta Fields Black, African-American and Afro-Caribbean scholar from Carnegie Mellon. Both of these these women have lived, PhDs, have lived in West Africa in rice growing regions, and they were struck by the fact that people who had talked about the rice connection before totally missed the fact that this is driven by women's knowledge and work. And and to give the, everybody a little bit of an explanation, in rice growing regions of West Africa and most of West Africa, there's there's gender and age divides in work. You do this, I do this. They do that, we do this. Everybody plays a role in society and in the raising of the crops that sustain life. And those crops are associated with the with the spirituality, the religion, the history, the genealogy of the people. And in especially where rice is raised in wet areas, wetland areas, the men do the clearing and the plowing, the women do the seeding and the and the cultivation. Everybody harvests together, and then the women process the rice. And that's why between 1750 and 1775, there was a flood of these human beings, commodities, human beings, our mothers brought over. Now the now the men some the some of the rice growing men were there too because it was also not just the rice but the basketry to fan the rice. So you still see those sea island baskets to this day. Sweet grass baskets. Well those were used in the rice using processing rice. And also the carving of the mortars and pestles that was done by the men. Um but the women had that knowledge. And let me just be blunt here. I'm just gonna just gonna say this. When people decenter black women they just center black people. Just to, just to make some claim about Jefferson smuggling rice once on pain of death out of Italy, or talking about native folks, indigenous folks. And I, you know, I I know indigenous chefs. I I, I stand them as much as anybody else. But that's not the story that I'm telling. I'm sorry, telling the story of thousands of people whose descendants would live lives of disenfranchisement. John Lewis author of our newest attempt at securing voting rights is a Mende descendant, just like me, Sierra Leone. So is Andrew Young. So is Coretta, so is, uh, Coretta Scott King. We're all, we're this, all of us and then some are descendants. Questlove, descendants of these people who came from Sierra Leone and mm-hmm. Liberia the Gullah Geechee people who became the enslaved on these rice plantations. And when you dissenter them, you're dissentering the fact that the womb of the black woman was the most important commodity in the United States before the Civil War ended. Mm. That's a dark and evil and horrifying part of our history. And it just it's just it's just a thing. It's just a thing. And you got to push through it and you got to honor your mother's poor libation and burn some sage and pray on it. And teach yes. people, and make them educated. But you know, by 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 going on, by running rings and tr- all this rigmarole, trying to evade this, and trying to decenter this history and the contribution, what they're doing is saying, I don't want to pay attention to the facts and the figures. I just want to go back to the part where I'm the one who's centered, mm-hmm. and you are on the periphery. Mm-hmm. And you know, I refuse to do that. Yeah, yeah. And one thing that I enjoyed was that you didn't do that at all. You certainly um, 
were centering African-American food, um, African food. You also, in rice, you also gave other recipes like Asian recipes, native recipes, mm -hmm. indigenous recipes. So it wasn't just um, African food or black food. It was also, these are, these are the recipes that other people make with rice that are also very good, you know? And you right. gave the history of those as well. So I thought it was an excellent job. I'm probably gonna make some rice right after this. Um, <laughs> So in the book, you talked a lot about your grandmother's red rice, and you said um, that that was your favorite recipe for rice. You loved it. And so talk me through like the meaning of that dish for you, what it meant for you um, to eat it. And um, yeah, what's so special about that dish for you? So like red rice is like people call it red rice now because the low country has made itself known for the red rice. When I was on Padma Lakshmi show, I made red rice, although not quite successfully because I'll, I'll give you the real tea. So like they wanted me to, they want to catch every part of the recipe on camera. Now, you know how usually when you make something on a cooking show or something, you got the like the backup? Yes, the fake we, pot that's already done. Like already done. And yeah. that, it's, more, it's more than just time. It's actually just like, just in case. If Padma comes up there and I love Padma. Please, just everybody, I love Padma. Padma is, is really fantastic um, for more than one reason. And Padma comes up and I hand her this thing of water. And I'm realizing as I hand it to her that the water isn't measured perfectly. And then she keeps pouring and pouring. I'm like, oh my God. I'm like, in my head, I'm going, this rice is going to be mushy. It's not going to be the way it's supposed to be. Oh, no. And I was just like, oh, and just, you, you don't tell Padma locks me on camera. She, girl, hold up. That's too much water now. Too much water. No, no. You gonna let her pour as much water she want in that pot. Okay. Um, but the bottom line is that you know, our rice and especially southern rice and African rice and Caribbean rice, we like every rain, every grain distinct. It's not mushy, it's not, it's not um, it's not um uh, not there's mushy rice, but there's also sticky rice. Mm -hmm. And sticky rice serves the purpose because you're eating with chopsticks. It, it, you eat it in little bunches. You, you, know, you don't eat it grain by grain. You eat it in little bunches. You pull to, quickly pull to the mouth. Whereas in Africa, they're eating with the right hand or with the spoon, you know, from a communal bowl. And the sauce clings to the rice. And whatever is in it, the, the, the black eyed peas or the greens or the meat or the fish or the seafood, whatever, it form, you know, it kind of clumps up together and you eat it in clumps. But with every right, the, the grain should be separate and distinct. Um, and so my grandmother would make what we called back in the day, Spanish rice. Well, none Spanish about it. <laughs> it was, you know, and it's funny because it's like this same rice can be found in Brazil in majority African areas. It can be found in Veracruz in Mexico where they call it Aros Mexicana. I'm like, okay, man, hold up. But the rice came into Mexico through, through the slave trade with the presence of Africans. And has a, it's the same recipe. Rice, tomatoes, peppers, onions, and whatever and whatever else you want to add on to that. So what they call red rice in South Carolina, they call jambalaya in Louisiana, but they, you know, it's just a little bit different of the mixture, but it's the same basic idea. Yeah. And, and that's another thing I loved about the book was that the same things that we call here is just the same recipe or maybe tweaked a little bit will be the same sort of meal in another you know, country is that kind of we all have these shared same experiences around. Yeah, like, like rice and beans. Like, you know, IT has the original right red red beans and rice. Then Louisiana has red beans and rice. And then Cuba has the black beans and, and rice. But you know, it's also gallo pinto in um Costa Rica. They eat beans and rice all over Venezuela, Colombia. But every single time the links are that the presence of Africans and black women who are doing the cooking. And it's just this, this consistency. And this, this is worker food. This is poor people's food. Mm -hmm. In Brazil, they call it, call, you know, black bean. Okay. So if I was to tell you that, that somebody made a meal of beans and rice and greens, collard greens, specifically collard greens, something that's like grits and barbecue and hot sauce, you say, hold up. But that's feijoada. That's the national meal of Brazil. And so again, like you said, this is global, this that's just within the West, the, the world of the African Atlantic. 
the westward facing African diaspora. We're not even talking about East Africa. We're not even talking about what happens when you go to the islands of the Indian Ocean or Madagascar, where some of my ancestors came from as well. It, it, it's, 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 and then beyond that, the world of the Middle East, where rice plays an incredibly important role from the Levant to Iran or India, where, you know, there's thousands of varieties of rice. Or China, where which which is where Asian rice was originally domesticated, t- was what eleven, ten, and eleven thousand years ago. So this this food is so ancient, and there's something there's something really cool about the fact that all people who grow rice have the same exact phrase, which is the word the the words for "Are you hungry?" Trend usually translate out to "Have you eaten rice today?" Wow. It doesn't matter if you're in Senegal or in Cambodia. Everybody thinks this the exact same way. Have you had some rice today? In other words, have you had a meal? Have you eaten? Wow, that's amazing. So um, how how did you even get involved into writing about rice? Like what, I know the Savor of the South books, um, they have like pecans and stuff like that, but how did you choose rice? Like how did that come about for rice? So the editor, Elaine Maisner, um, big shout out to her. Um, sh- she was like, well, this last book is a movie of rice. We, I can't think of anyone else I want to write about it. And um, it's, it's, I think it's because this one ingredient has really told a, a big story yeah. for me. My grandmother, like I said, she was from Alabama. So by the time this recipe or I would, I, I, I'm going I'm to go less specific and say this idea about how to prepare the rice and the, f- the dinner came down to her. Her great grandmother was born in South Carolina. And then we think, we think that she had been there, her mother, her mother's mother, and then her uh, mother's mother's mother, the, her, her uh, great grandmother's great grandmother came from Africa. That's the math. Like it gets you right to that time period that we're talking about where all these people came in from Sierra Leone, Guinea, Guinea Bissau, Liberia, and Senegal, and the Western part of Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast. So it's like, that's, that's, a, that's a minute. And then I just kind of thought, before I did any of this work, sister, I thought, I don't, I, I don't really know what, what is a part of me and what's not. So I remember like getting really angry and upset at the MAD conference in Denmark where everybody was anybody was there. Burdain, um, Zimmern, um, David Chang, um, Alex Atala, every, all these big, sh- all these, all the big chefs. Um, and here I am getting angry from this crowd about how like, you know, we can't afford to buy the heritage rice of our ancestors, we had to go to the bodega. We got to go to the corner shop. We're not getting real food, but the real food that our ancestors grew is economically out of reach. I was banging on this this uh, log they had. They had this old log, kind of like a podium. And I don't. And I had this this fire in me. I don't know where it came from. I think ten days later, I was in North Carolina doing a dinner um, for 150 people, Stagville Plantation. And um, joined by other African American interpreters preparing the food, etc. And I got my first African ancestry results. Give me the 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 the, the results of who my direct ancestors were. Wow. You know, mother's line, mother, mother, mother. Father's line, father, father, father. So the mother side came first, and my great 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 grandmother was very was very uh, light. Her daughter said, I don't have no Negro blood in me. And so I'm just thinking, oh, hell. I'm in front of 100 plus, 150 plus people, and I'm about to get told I'm Irish or something. Oh my goodness. Which I already kind of knew. I mean, I, I can look at my face, look at my eyes, and look at my hair and know that I'm right. right. But I was just like, please, let this not be the line, the one that did it. Well, lucky for me, only 1% of African Americans have that history. And if you do, if, typically, if you do have a white female ancestor on your family tree, that means your people were likely free. Wow. That's a big deal. But she says the words, your maternal line comes from a small 
country on the coast of West Africa. And I started, you can, I, the video's on YouTube. I started flipping out. And first of all, because that whole lie about I ain't really black, totally was, the, whoosh, okay? Then she goes, known for growing rice. And I just was like, 10 wow. days ago, you were preaching about this rice and how it was part of your people and your family. And you didn't even know that was actually very true. It really is. It was a part of your family. Yep. She said, Mende people of Sierra Leone, the people who turned the, turn the Amistad around, turned the boat around. Wow. So this was your destiny. I, ho I hope so. I mean, it's a small part. I mean, I mean, in some ways, I got to be real with you. Some of my teachers, like my chef brother, BJ Dennis, or um, Sally Ann Robinson, who grew up on Defusky Island. This is more, even more a part of them than it is of me. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really critical to to tell people that sometimes, um, like you said in the very beginning, the food leads you. The food tells you who you are. The food is more than just the food. The food is your story. It's yeah. your people. It's everything. And I think it's I think it's I think it's I think it's interesting that like a lot of people who came over on those boats had the same kind of myth, and I'll tell you, tell you really quickly. It, it said that they the people put the seeds in their hair. Not likely. I'm going to tell you right now, that probably did not happen for many reasons. Um, I especially get kind of graded when people say the things on the internet, like they were, they were concerned they wouldn't have food, so they put the seeds in their hair. Honey, five little dry grains of rice ain't going to do nothing for you in three months. <laughs> that rice is not never going to make you 80. Never, and plus, remember our ancestors a lot of them had their hair, their hair, their head was shaved mm -hmm. or seriously cut down because remember those boats were full of lice, mm -hmm. rats, and other vermin. It was awful. It was awful. But I guess the point is, is that what they were trying to say was the seeds of the knowledge. Because remember, our ancestors didn't say things outright. They didn't say things that you could get on first meaning. Like steal away to Jesus is, 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 does, mean, does not mean euthanize me tonight. <laughs> it means I'm trying to roll out. And, you know, get me a um, uh, a maple donut in Toronto because I got to run and get my freedom. Okay. I got to go to Drake, a Drake concert tonight okay. with, with Henry Tubman. I ain't got time for the slavery nonsense. Not the Drake concert. <laughs> Not the Drake concert. But it like, with like saying seeds in your hair and your, it does not mean, uh, it means your head. It means yeah. the point of knowledge. And I think that's so important um, to tell. Yeah. Um, so... Talking about your life trajectory a little bit, um, you did you expressed a little bit how you didn't like uh, when you were growing up. You didn't really like soul food. You didn't really like being black. And now, a blog, two books later, like you're doing some really, really fascinating and amazing work. And um, so you have a line of spices out. Like, what was your when you were ten years old? What did you think you were going to be when you were growing up? I I told well by the time I was seven, I told my 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 mother and father asked me. I said, what do you want to grow up? What do you be when you grow up? And I said, Mom and Daddy, I want to be um, a preacher, a chef, a teacher, and a writer. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. right, right. And you and you conveniently forget these things. And then one day you, you think and you realize it and you, you catch your breath. You know, when I was very little, I mean, I grew up in a fast food generation. Nobody wanted their nobody wanted their food at home. Yeah. Everybody wanted pizza. Everybody wanted KFC. Everybody wanted McDonald's. Um, and, I mean, it was also a little bit of affluence for for those of us who are of color, right? Because it meant you didn't have to eat every meal at home. Yeah, where mamas and daddies. I mean, I, I never forget my mother telling the same story as a woman I met many years later, where she goes, where my mom is not here with us anymore, but mama would say, you know, all these kids. Grandma would take that 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 one burger, that one sandwich, <laughs> split it, you know, and that's the way that's the way it worked. And I mean, I couldn't imagine that because you know my cousins and I were these selfish little greedy buggers, and we wanted that we wanted our own happy meal. Yeah, we want our own burger, right? Own a burger, and then but then you know, but I, what I guess one of the things that I was talking about was like the fact that we dance around issues of. Self hatred. I think Michael Harriet wrote this incredible thread on Twitter the other day ago, where he talks about how his mother shielded him. He thought the Hardy Boys were black until he got to high school, homeschool. 
So he didn't know that there was this whole other world out there because his mom was so against him absorbing a world that didn't have room for him mm. or made or made characters out of black caricatures out of black people. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was like, I'm here I am growing up in the late seventies, early eighties. Bo Derek is running around with her hair and cornrows and all these dudes have lost their damn mind. And they're calling the, the cornrows, the Bo Derek. Oh. Right. She was in 10 and her blonde, I mean, don't get me started on that. And then, of course, Dynasty, right? And I and I, I don't I don't mean to show my gay right now, but my life changed the minute I saw the legs and heels of Diane Carroll walk on the stage. I was like, oh, right. I have a role model. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell some white woman that, that her that her caviar is 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 tired, her champagne is burned one day too. Yes. And, you know, but I, I think people need to understand, like, and then I'm watching George Jefferson trying to figure out, okay, this man is rich and he's black and he should have some power, but he just like, he acts like a clown all the time. Mm -hmm. And everybody is trying to, like, get him and not act like a clown and live up to his potential. And it's just, like all these weird messages. And so being black becomes very strange in that territory, you know, because, you know, comic books, Richie Rich is a white boy. Yeah. And then the the, the 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 cute people. This, I mean, I would have failed the doll test. But the, but here's the that's not the where the energy's at. The energy, or even with the food, like when I was growing up, I remember the pots of, of like ham hock or whatever, and black eyed peas, for example, and even the greens and all these bones in the pot. And when you're watching TV and you're looking at these, you know, these 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 cooking shows. Well, people don't have bones in their pot. That today people today people brag about that, right? Yeah. But back then, that was just uh, our version of oh, our gross ethnic food, that country food, whatever we're eating. And then it just didn't make sense to me. And it, and I remember the Chitlins Day. Oh God, I still can't eat Chitlins, but now, blah, right, right. And I mean, in the sink, and the smell, and the kitchen, and um, a uniquely DC version. That was those were the days my mom used to take me to the National Zoo, <laughs> right? Because the, the zoo smelled better than our house on Chitlin Day. And it wasn't even all of us eating. It was like three of us eating it. Mm -hmm. Three of us creating hell for everybody else. Yes. I guess I say this because my grandmother, my mother, my father, and other people took the time to really wrestle me out of not a, it wasn't a big, big, big thing, but it was a big deal. It wasn't, you know, they wanted me to have, so I had, I mean, I remember having my mom with, with my mother and my mother and father slapped up various posters on the wall. I had the great kings and queens of Africa. You remember that one? And I had like, you know, I had like black inventors. And um, there was a book that one of my professors, Howard actually wrote, and they had a poster series, Great Negroes, Past and Present. So I then, so every morning I woke up. And that's the part that some people who, who critique me don't seem to read, is every morning I woke up. I, the first thing I saw was our kings and queens, mm -hmm. and I don't. And I, I'm, I know. I know some people in the community. <coughs> excuse me. Um, don't have time for that, or they are. They micro argue that down. But I think that if, it, but but I think it's more important to put their best and best foot forward first, and really have your child absorb that. Yeah. Your child will learn that they are peasants and they are farmers and they are craftsmen and craftswomen. Um, but they're also going to learn that they come from a, a people of renown, a people of excellence, a people of skill and ability. Okay. I love that answer. Um, we're going to take some questions sure. from the audience. Right on time. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. Okay. Vivian asked, why, why, do, why write about rice? Uh, so there's, so first, I think uh, Rachel brought it up. This is part of the Savor the South series. So there's a lot of books about various individual ingredients, like collard greens, buttermilk, uh, catfish, shrimp and crab, oyster, whatever. And I guess, I guess it's really to focus people in on the array of diversity within Southern food of each ingredient. So for example, buttermilk, might be the coating for the chicken as well as the biscuit that you eat it with, as well as the, the cake you might have for dessert. In the same way, rice is rice pudding, it's gumbo. And that's, that's one of the things I kind of should mention is that I really pushed 
for um, certain recipes that weren't directly rice, but they were, but you have to understand without the rice, those recipes are nothing. Yes, there are so many recipes in this book for anybody who wants to learn more about rice, how to cook rice better, whatever. There are so many different kinds of rice recipes in the book. It's not just white rice or wild rice or it's gumbo, it's rice pudding. It's so many different kinds of things. And this book really opened my eyes to see like how rice is like integrated in almost everything in every dish that we cook. And also like we, we've forgotten a lot of things too. Like right. rice waffles, rice bread, kalas, which are the which are the fritters that you they used to make, but they're reviving in New Orleans and other places. And actually, kalas were everywhere, but in by different names. So it's like basically you take like rice that's cooked, that's kind of soft and mushy, and you roll up into a ball and you deep fry it like a donut. Wow! And you would have that with with cane syrup or with um powdered sugar. Wow, that sounds really good. I actually want that now. Um, so how will Michael adapt this information on rice and his historical reenactments or teachings post-COVID? What will he add in and how? So um, I guess everybody is trying to get back to the historic kitchens and the museums to do the work and we an audience to demonstrate that for it. It's, you know, it is what it is until everybody catches sense. It's going to be a way, it's going to be a minute. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, sure. So, but I, I've been doing some more homework, and I was talking with Dr. David Shields, who is a, um, a savant of rice history um, and agriculture, and and Glenn Roberts, another um, great figure in this. And I was talking to them about the how the the different that he said to me that Carolina Gold, the rice that kind of spurred on the. Um, the the queen of the they call rice the queen of the field the queen of the kitchen was um has been more genetically documented than than almost any other you know tropical species of rice wow and part of it's because of this connection to our history um he, t he mentioned i was doing some homework he said that since 2007 when they discovered that um carolina gold rice has a lot of genetic genes in common with bankaram which is one variety of Asian rice that was grown in Ghana hundreds of years ago. So, I mean, it's, it's, there's so much more to be learned. Um, but I think now um, we have uh, Chief Infamara in uh, up in upstate New York, who's growing rice, one variety of rice, upland rice from West Africa that grew, matures in about four to five months and showing people the entire, the entire cycle and how it's raised and raising it to sell. Um, this is, there's a whole new world of folks who are making the connection. And also, I just really want to work on, um, connecting our African diaspora family around rice so they can know that we're, we're connected. This is part of our familyhood. Um, Ellis asks, what advice would you give to someone who wants to write a cookbook and weave in personal or historical narratives? Organize, organize, organize. Think about context, context, context. Um, leave no stone unturned and leave no person uninterviewed. Um, you know, we forget that we have all these, these libraries around us called our elders. And that some of them may not be blood, but they are a source of knowledge and we need them. We need to, I'm, I'm encouraging everybody, please, in your family, in your community, use this time with your little Zoom and your whatever and this, that and other to record their stories for posterity and then write them down and then make sure that they're in four or five different forms and they're spread around who people you trust so that we can always have those things. Put them, put, if you're comfortable and they're comfortable, put them up on YouTube or somewhere else on the internet so they can live forever. Because I'm telling you, we, need, we are forgetting that history isn't later, history is right now. Yeah. And there's so, and you know, you know this, I know this, because of our migrations, we're all over the place now. We're not in one spot anymore. So it's so important to get those stories down, but that's what becomes the basis of that kind of work. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we will never run out of the need for personal, ge genealogically related, familial food writing and cookbooks, especially when it comes to communities of color, mm -hmm. because our history often gets obfuscated, ignored, or not recorded. Mm -hmm. 
And I think the most important part about all of this, Raisha, is that people need to understand we don't we need to have a lot of that personal narrative as much as the recipe. Because people forget we have actual lives. Yeah. We're kids. You know, I you know, we're we're our, our, we're not mothers first, we're little girls who became teenage girls, who became grown grown women, who became moms or didn't become moms, who became community leaders and teachers. Where you know, where young men and boys who who will at some point become elders and ancestors, and so it's so critical to to include all that because it's a humanity. I didn't realize that my mom wasn't just my mom until I really heard her one day, mm-hmm. and I was like, and I I read something she wrote, and I just said, oh wow, my mother was a kid. You know, my mother wasn't yeah. always my mama. Right. And so it's so important to, to to use those those kind of works to appreciate and respect yeah. the life journeys and the narratives and the humanity of, yeah. of our people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's important. I agree with that. Um, Cynthia says, your work is inspiring. How do you suggest we learn more about the lives of our ancestors? I'm interested in ways to experience the lives of my ancestors similarly to your Williamsburg mm-hmm. residency. Well, thank you, Cynthia. Um, I mean, here, I mean, I, 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 if the pandemic wasn't here, I mean, I know Joe McGill does similar work. I've worked with Joe McGill before. He does the slave cabin stayovers. Some people can't hang. It's deep. Mm -hmm. And others, and I told the, I told this one group of young men, I said, you know, you really need to do this. He said, though, I'll feel weird. I feel scared. I feel whatever. I said, you are safer than anywhere else. You're with your ancestors. They gonna they gonna they got your back. Yeah. Go in there and go in there and have a have a have a have a, a sleep cut. You know, you and I both know that our answers oftentimes when they visit us, they come to us in our dreams. Mm. Look, you know, because when we awake, we gonna just gonna pee ourselves and faint. Right. <laughs> and in dream time, it's okay, okay, fine. Yeah. All right. So I think it's so important to really kind of grasp your history through experiential knowledge. And so, Cynthia, one thing I would do to encourage you in that is, you know, do more homework on these historic recipes. Prepare them. Prepare them with other family members. Taste them. Think about how they've changed over time. Think about what it means to have certain ingredients but not others. I mean, really process the differences. Go to the places where you know you have ancestry. You know, it could be Prince George's County. could be um, Williamsburg, Virginia. could be Alabama. could be Kentucky. could be Texas. could be somewhere else. Go to those spaces, even when those spaces have dramatically changed, which some of them inevitably will have. Go to those woods, go to those swamps, go to those fields, go to those roadsides, go to those historic markers and just feel. Mm-hmm. A lot of this, a lot of this isn't just scholarship, it's intuition. You know, um, mm-hmm. we our, our, we don't we vibe to a different tone. And so some of the forms of knowledge that we have are not forms of knowledge that you can learn in school. In a book, yeah. Right, you gotta feel them, process them. Mm -hmm. And then once you have that, yes, you do need the rigor of scholarship. Yes, you do need an imagination and and make hypotheses happen. You need to do all these different parts. And then there's a moment where I will tell you both, you feel, they start talking to you in different ways. Um, I went into, uh, I was at Arlington House, which you know is Arlington Cemetery. It was the plantation of Robert E. Lee. And I was talking to the um, the um, staff there, the, the Park Service staff, and they took me to where the kitchen was. It was a very different kitchen from anyone I'd, I'd ever seen. So it was a little disorienting, but when I went and I sat down, I just said, I just, I just need a minute to sit down. And then I just started to like move my hand up and down and like sort of hit this piece of wood. And I was like, this is where the beaten biscuits were made. Mm. And over there was where they did the, and they, and you know what was creepy? It was like her, her mouth drops open and then she pulls out this book. And it was a description of what life in the kitchen. And I was, I was right. Oh. But that's because, you know, you listen, once you start listening, the door is open. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, what do you think soul food and Southern cuisine defer? <laughs> um, I'm going to say something tongue in cheek and for real, for real. 
Soul food and Southern cuisine are just like Jefferson's uh, widow. Well, well, his, no, his widow. His dead wife and um, Sally Hammonds. Mm. You realize Sally Hammonds and Jefferson's dead wife were sisters. Mm. They were half sisters. That's deep, isn't it? Okay. And then her brother James was the, the greatest chef in early colonial America. Mm. You know, Parisian and, and Versailles training. And then he comes back and takes Southern ingredients, African techniques and know-how, mixes them with French technique and creates this gourmet Southern cooking. Wow. And no other, you know. So I had to almost to say that, you know, um, Southern has been co-opted by whiteness. But we are all products of the South. But I think in the in the gloss, it's become Southern means white and soulful means us. Mm. Mm -hmm. But I'll mm -hmm. tell you why. Soul food is the memory cuisine of the great and great great grandchildren of the enslaved. The memory cuisine, like so, for example, the the straight up, the straight up um, cuisine of migration, of memory, of motion. So, like in celebration, and it's also celebration cuisine elevated as everyday food, which is mm -mm, right. Everybody has everyday food and everybody has celebration food. But if you ask most American ethnic groups, what is your food? They're going to talk about the food they eat when it's a party, when it's a, 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 a religious holiday, mm -hmm. celebration, or when it's a special day. Um, and I think soul food is not so much the canon, as my friend Therese Nelson put it. But the construct. Mm. So it's an it's ideas about food and color and appearance and flavor and taste and abundance and sufficiency. It's not a set menu. And if you look at look at it that way, as proto soul food or African American vernacular cuisine as being this bigger body of foods, then you can't separate the two Southern from soul food because as Edna Lewis said, there ain't no Southern without soul. Mm. Like we, we will always be the 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 grandmama of Southern food. We will always be the um, forgive how this sounds. The 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 skillet in the woodpile. <laughs> you can't tell that story without that. Okay, yeah. let me. Can I just shoot this one? What will I write about next? Yeah. So, Kosher Soul is my next book after this. Okay. Yes, and I am working on. Uh, um, I am soon to. Uh, have a contract um, with a um, with another with another publisher. So I still work with Harper Collins. My, my, hey, Harper Collins, my favorites. Thank you for the ride. I'm still on the train. UNC Press. Thank you for this ride. Okay. Um, but I have a, but I have another publisher where I'm going to do, be doing a. Um, they do these Bible cookbooks, and basically like these like one one stop shop source cookbooks. And I'm doing one on the American South. Wow. And I want people to understand, Black authors have not, well, it's like the last question, right? Black authors really have not been in the employ to really mastermind these volumes because we haven't been seen as the, the but what happens when one of us does this and amplifies the voices of our women, the voices of our cousins, the voices of the people who have not, people who weren't on the high eat high on the hog, the people who are outliers and marginalized, what happens when you write a cookbook knowing that history and having that history and that culture in mind? It means you stop the propaganda and stop the narratives that decenter you and you yeah. begin to have narratives that include everybody. Yes. Especially let people understand. I'm not, you know, I'm not claiming that we do everything. Certainly not. We have did they beat it been everything. We certainly not. But I am making a stake of the claim that without us, the story cannot be told at all. Yeah. And so kosher soul will talk about me being black and Jewish. And the other one will talk about how our, having a more complete picture of the cooking of the American South. I wish we had more time. There was so much to touch on in both of those books. I'm so excited that you're here. Thank you so much no, for joining us. Please let us know where we can find you on social media, follow your work, that sort of thing. I personally follow you on Twitter. You're hilarious. But yeah, Kosher Soul, uh, at Kosher Soul on, on Twitter, okay. and The Cooking Gene on IG, on Instagram. And uh, Michael W twenty on um, my Facebook page, and of course um, Afro Culinaria is my blog. 
All right. All right. Thank you so much. And Kyla, whenever you're ready to come back. So thank you so much for having, for being here. We really appreciate it. That was absolutely fantastic. Both of you. I just, thank you. Um, it's an absolute honor to have you join us, Mr. Twitty. I thank you so much for your time and for your work. For those of you viewing at home, you can get Rice, a Save with a South cookbook, as well as the Cooking Gene, which I will hold up for you in case you haven't had a chance to see it yet, um, from the library's partner. Yeah, on the library yeah. part of the independent bookstore, Loyalty Books. Um, they have branches in Maryland and D.C., and they will also ship to you wherever you are. Uh, and you can also borrow it from the library. Um, and on that note, on behalf of um, my agency, the Prince George's County Human Relations Commission, I really want to thank the Prince George's County Memorial Library System for their partnership on this event, as well as so much of our other programming. And Raisha, Thank you for moderating this evening. Oh, no problem. Thank you so much. Completely fantastic. Nick, thank you for all your work doing things behind the scenes. And thank you to everyone viewing tonight. I hope it has been as interesting and illuminating for you as it has been for me. And I hope you can come to some of our other programs. Uh, I'll, we have many, and a couple of which I'll just briefly tell you about. Uh, tomorrow, we talk with Robert Hamilton about his new book, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the Poor People's Campaign of 1968. That's tomorrow at uh, 12 noon Eastern. On Thursday at 4, we'll be talking to Sylvia Dassey about the African diaspora in Prince George's County. And next week, Monday, we will hold a roundtable discussion as part of our Women in Faith Diverse Voices Speak series. So to learn more about those and all of our other up upcoming events, you can go to tinyurl.com, PGC HRC events, or pgcmls.info slash events. And you can follow us on Twitter at HRC PG County or the library across all platforms at PGC MLS. I, again, thank you for tuning in this evening. And Mr. Twitty, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Prince George's County. Thank you.